Not even a month since Champs has ended, we've seen massive moves in the America's League. Player after player after player being dropped, cut, and or just flat out disrespected. It doesn't matter if you win, it doesn't matter if you're a star. It doesn't even matter if you're a champion. The great market correction of 2023 does not care. It is already here and best believe this is just the beginning. But the question is, how in just one year after franchising did we get here as an eSport? There are some obvious answers as well as some subtle hints from the past that led us here. Let's look at Evil Genius for example. They had a great year making over a million dollars in prize winning. However, if these rumor salaries are correct, then they're well in the negative if you include the cost of travel, their media team, taxes, and other costs needed to run an eSport. If EG can't make a profit with these salaries, then most teams can't solely offer tournament winnings. However, I must say some orgs like Evil Genius don't capitalize on their success and position in Valorant. Look at this champion's gear. There's other things that they can do, but I will get into that later in the video. When it comes to who can share the blame for what's going on in the America's League, we have to look at the main parties that make up Valorant Esports. First, we have Riot Games, the creators of Valorant itself and the driving force for this amazing esport. Professional players, the reason why so many of us decide to watch, to suffer, and to celebrate the pinnacle of Valorant's most skilled fans, the ones who can lift teams and players to celebrity status or help aid in their downfall. Team organizations, a central hub to give players and fans deeper connections and personality. All four of these groups are necessary for Valorant's esports. If one of these pillars go, then the whole show may go with it. They're all connected and all affected by what's going on. Now, let's talk about the players themselves. Originally, I wanted to give them 0% for all the shenanigans going on in the America's League. It's not their fault that teams are willing to bid 30k a month salaries for them. If you're presented with a choice of going with the minimum or getting a fat stack of cash for doing the same job, You'll be a fool not to take the cash, especially since a career in esports is typically short lived. However, I think players need to realize what job security really looks like in an esports like Valorant. Congratulations for being the top 0% of all gamers who tried their hands at Valorant. However, there will always be someone better than you. If not now, then probably in the near future. Skill alone won't guarantee you a spot in T1 while making over six figures. As I mentioned earlier with EG, winning tournaments alone sometimes cannot justify those huge salaries as a team. There's a reason why Tenz is the only player left on the Sentinels team that won Masters Reykjavik. He had the biggest brand out of them all. There's a reason why Asuna still has a job with 100 Thieves. His following is larger than his teammates. Yes, both are cracked at the game, but at one time and point, they were not the best players on their teams. In terms of just skill alone, they can be replaced. Their following, however, is harder to find. C9 proved this with an 8 1 finish in the Americas after letting Ye go. If Ye's contract was not making the money, his brand may have not justified his contract. You could also say that C9 didn't know how to use Ye's presence correctly either. I will go deeper into this later in the video. Now, I don't know how much these players are making on team contracts, but the orgs are happy to keep certain people around for their draw. As a player though, this can be an opportunity to build a brand that can last years after your esports career is over, like some have done already. Building that brand gives you leverage to demand more money too. Shoot, this is a business. You can still negotiate. You can even bet on yourself with a one-year contract that asks for more if you really think your skills are enough and if you think you can build that brand within a year. At the end of the day though, I doubt we can blame the players too much for all of this. Next, we have Riot Games. I would say this pillar is only responsible for 10% of what's going on right now. This is my way of basically telling you that they have a very small hand in all the chaos happening in the Americas. It's not their fault that orgs and NA are overspending. You don't see this problem too much in EMEA, where they know what the end game really is. Plus, Riot has been very generous. Actually, you can say out of all the gaming companies out there, Riot has been the most generous by giving out their own money to orgs in the form of stipends and even have plans to release team cosmetics in the future. This is something that has been a struggle for EA and Epic Games to do for Apex and Fortnite's competitive scene. However, there's still some blame to be given. First thing Riot did was put the America's League in LA, one of the most expensive cities in America. This puts a financial strain on not just the orgs but the players too. There's only two reasons why I can think Riot 
did this. First is to be closer to Riot HQ, and second, there's a lot of talent in production that is available in this area. However, I think Texas would have been a better fit. No state income tax would have been a blessing to the players who decide to live there on league minimum. And I think Dallas probably would have been an awesome choice since complexity is based there too. So talent for production shouldn't be that much of an issue. There's also Austin where a lot of people from LA are already moving there. It is getting kind of expensive, but nowhere near that of Los Angeles. The second point I want to mention is related to franchising. When Riot said no to the first ever team to win champions, that sends a message. When you say no to a very successful team and org with rich esports history, that sends a message. When you refuse to give a permanent spot to those teams in T2 that are clearly better than the teams that you let into T1, that sends a message. A message that business comes first. Winning is an afterthought. It sucks to say this, but they may have a point. The love of the game does not pay the bills. Capitalism is the end all and be all when it comes to VCT. So much so that players who actually deserve a huge payday don't get it from their original orcs. Okay, now we have the fans. If there's any party that can say they're 100% innocent, you can find them here. There's a reason why the prize pool and the champions bundle revenue increases so much this year compared to the other previous years. The fans love to show out their support for a wonderful esports. I think it sucks that supporters of EG, C9, NRG, and Loud may have a hard time rooting for their teams next year because the orgs will look so different. All that fans ask for is a, a great product, and you know Valorant enthusiasts will shell out a lot of money for that product, as long as that product is good. And now that leaves us with the orgs, the ones who have to take on most of the responsibility for the great market correction of 2023. It would be one thing if the losing teams were the ones doing the cutting and the winners were the ones keeping their talent, but it's quite the opposite here in the America's League. The teams underachieving the most are the ones signing new premium talent, and the winners are the ones letting their talented pros go. Arguably, their greatest assets heading into 2024, a year where Riot plans on releasing team skins with revenue sharing. How do you expect people to buy your product when players that they cheer for are gone? A year that could mean huge payday for those who are actual winners. Now, this leads me to another reason why I think orgs may be running their company poorly. If you're using the majority of investor funds just on salaries, then you may be failing as a business. Everyone used to like to make fun of 100 Thieves for their hoodie org days, but at least they know how to make a product and content that people want to consume. Even TSM used their connection and leverage in esports to push products people use, like their acquisition of Blitz GG, even though some of their players and content creators don't use it. Honestly seems like a missed opportunity, in my opinion, to promote a product effortlessly. Nonetheless, orgs like Loud and EG could easily bring in more sponsors too, because people are going to watch winners. Orgs need to use the money from investors more wisely to build their brands too. They need to learn from their mistakes as well as the mistakes of others, because I really hope we don't have to go through this again in the future.